Hello, and welcome to EDH Rex Upping the Average, where we take a commander's average deck list as compiled by the data on EDH Rec and make some quick swaps to it to help take it from a good start to a great one. Let's talk about some dinosaurs. Puntlaza Sunfavored is a new entry to lead the Naya Dinosaurs archetype. 5 mana 4 4, it allows us to discover X once each turn whenever we get a dino into play, where X is the toughness of that dino. Discover, of course, is like a new cascade ability, so in other words, free spells! Puntlaza has already amassed more than 2,600 decks to its name. Every day that I sat down to work on this video, it had another hundred or so under its belt. And we can tell from its page that it's running a lot of heavy hitters. But how is it looking deck wise? Let's grab Puntlaza's list from the average deck feature and import it to the Archidect deck building website. As always, any swaps we make to this deck must either keep the total cost neutral or else help lower the overall price of the list. Gishath's Sun's Avatar is largely considered the de facto Naya Dino commander, and I know that for many they'll still prefer what Gishath is serving over what Puntlaza is serving. You can't deny Puntlaza is compelling though, and I think as a commander it's also a little bit more forgiving. Gishath is very all eggs in one basket, whereas Puntlaza doesn't feel quite as commander centric. Looking over this list, I think it's clear that the most common things we discover from our commander's trigger are more mana resources. This incidentally makes it easier to recast Puntlaza on future turns if it gets removed, and of course makes it easier to cast bigger and bigger dinosaurs as the game progresses. And yes, in case you were wondering, we'll have two deck lists for this commander, one set of regular swaps and one more budget conscious version of the list at the end of the video. Before we start swapping anything, let's get to know the deck's core cards. This precon came with some absolutely ludicrous new dinos, especially those that draw a ton of cards. Low cost but high toughness creatures are also quite nice for Puntlaza's Discover Trigger, and I'm especially fond of cheap dinos that give us more mana, like Topiary Stomper. Or, you know, I'm also just fond of the classics. There are more than 30 creatures in this list. We have a lot of excellent dinosaurs in here. But possibly my favorite one is the new Wrathful Raptors. Just what an absolute blowout that card is. And Scion of Calamity is really great too. It's great for removal and for triggering our commander over and over. Also, I think it's important to note, Puntlaza Sunfavored is a May ability. You're not forced to discover off of the first dino that you get into play. You can save the discovery if you're confident that you'll get a bigger dino later in that turn. More importantly, Puntlaza says each turn, not just your own turn. This is why cards like Ephemerate and Monster Manual show up in this list, to help trigger the ability during other turns and get even more free things. Ephemerate in particular feels really nice to save the commander from pinpoint removal and get free stuff out of it. So, okay, now that we've seen the dino pen, how do we go about upgrading it? Sometimes it can be tough to know where you want to start off when it comes to making deck upgrades, but the first thing that I want to start us off with here is actually something that I did in a Gishath video ages and ages and ages ago. And I'm bringing it back here because, well, here in this deck, it's actually even easier now than it was for that deck then. It's practically free for this deck to have a companion. Kahira the Orphan Guard can be your companion if your deck contains only Cat, Elemental, Nightmare, or Dino creatures. So what does that mean for us? It means cutting just four cards from the deck, Xenagos and three humans that tap for mana. That is not a problem for me. I I'm gonna level with you. I'd wanna cut some of these out of the deck anyway. Xenagos, for instance, feels fine, but it's just a little bit off here. And as for the others, I mean, our strategy is already highly susceptible to board wipes, and we get so much into play so fast that people are actively searching for those board wipes to knock us down as quickly as possible. So then mana dorks will also perish to those enemy toxic deluges or vanquish the hordes. There are lots of creature-based decks out there that will get extra synergies off of playing mana dorks, such as like Beast Whisperer effects in their decks, but those types of synergies aren't present here in this deck. So I was tempted to switch up the ramp effects in this deck in the first place, get in some ramp spells or mana rocks that won't go away to a random Wrath of God so that we can rebuild more easily if we have to. This deck has a Cultivate, but it's missing a Kodama's Reach, for instance, and Nature's Lore, that's a great way to find dual-type lands. I'd add in three visits, but it's still like five or six bucks, sorry, so I'll opt for Felwar Stone instead, it's quick and simple. And if all we have to do is take out a 5 mana Xenagos and swap 3 mana dorks for 3 ramp spells, and that will give us a free companion in every game, 
I think that's solid. We don't even need to worry about Kahira all that much, to be honest. It's not like we're dying to get her into play every game. She's not even a dino herself, after all. But the point is just that it's very, very, very easy to have her as a companion for basically free. Because the cost of don't play these three easily replaceable humans that you may not draw anyway feels really minimal. And in return, we get a free card to just put into our hand in case we ever need it. Like if our plan stumbles and we need more bodies in the late game or something. Also, real quick, I'm using the cheaper edition of this card, but remember that all companions have been errated to have an ability that costs mana to put them into the hand first rather than playing them directly as a companion from that zone because Wizards of the Coast had to change the companion mechanic because the companion mechanic was... Um, w listen, we're in a dino deck, so I'll just quote Jurassic Park here. Scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Next, on the subject of mana, looking through things here shows us that some of the most expensive cards in the deck are artifacts, including the Incubator, which I don't actually like all that much. I think it's fine, I guess, but I don't think it's $25 fine. It has not escaped my notice that every day that I've been working on this video, the Incubator has been losing popularity on Pantlaza's EDH rec page. We have Herald's Horn in here, which is kind of similar, but it also has that top deck ability. I'll admit that I'm actually still a little iffy on the horn sometimes too. I've seen that top deck ability whiff a lot of times, but I can at least appreciate that it is doing two things. And actually, speaking of top deck whiffs, I think while I'm here, I also ought to cut Descendant's Path from the enchantment section too. I like the card, but again, I just keep seeing it whiff, and it needs us to have a creature in play for it to do anything at all. Harold's Horn is doing a little bit of the Incubator's job and a little bit of the Path's job, and for that, I think it kind of fits better. But for the Incubator and for the Path as individual cards, I think we can live without them. Because here's the thing, if we want to talk about enchantments that get stuff into play, I've never seen a deck in more desperate need of lurking predators. This is already one of the coolest enchantments you can cast in a creature-heavy deck, but remember, Pantlaza Sunfavored triggers every turn. So not only can we get free dinos into play, we can also get free discovers too. I much prefer this to the Descendant's Path. Like yes, it's more mana, but it doesn't require us to have a creature in play to trigger, and it triggers so many times each round that we're much more likely to swell our forces. This card's like five bucks right now, and it's probably still going up, but man is this card worth it. That's not the only enchantment I'm adding though. I want a sneak attack in this deck for pretty similar reasons. For one thing, it's just a cool card, but for another, it gives us more Pantlaza triggers on other people's turns. One red mana to trigger discover is neat, but it's not just that. One red mana gives us surprise blockers, aka people are afraid to attack us in case we flash something bonkers into play, especially if it has a good enrage trigger. One red mana means we're not spending an entire turn for a cool enter the battlefield effect. We can just get a Galta or an Earthshaker Dreadmaw's game-changing advantage really super quick. One red mana can trigger our elemental bonds and our Garrix uprisings so that we actually gain card advantage out of it. One red mana can be used on the opponent's end step before our turn to trigger our commander, and then since we're already past the beginning of the end step, we don't have to sacrifice that creature until the next end step after that so we can untap and attack with that creature while also playing a bunch of other stuff on our turn. Sneak attack is the perfect name for this card. It's super tricky. I like this card here a lot. Now, this deck contains a lot of classic board protection spells like Heroic Intervention, but we also saw the synergy that exists with cards like Ephemerate, right? Blinking a dino can re-trigger Pantlaza Sunflavored on other turns. <laughs> Sunflavored, huh? Okay. <clears throat> there we do. Blinking a dino can re-trigger Pantlaza Sunflavored on other turns. <laughs> Blinking a dino can re-trigger Pantlaza Sunflavored in... <clears throat> Blinking a dino can re-trigger Pantlaza Sun favored on other turns. Basically, I want to do a little more of that. I don't want to go overboard, we don't need like 10 blink effects here, but a few extra blink effects that protect our board and give us a bonus on top could be pretty cool. Importantly, I want to choose effects that won't feel totally crappy to discover into off of our commander's trigger. So, I'm starting with Touch the Spirit Realm. If we discover into it, it's a removal effect, always handy to have, but if it winds up in our hand, it can be discarded for two mana to save our commander from like a board wipe or single target removal, and it will re-trigger the discover when Pantlaza comes back. And in terms of saving more than just one creature, I went with Legion's Initiative and Lazel's Acrobatics, though some folks may end up going with stuff like Eerie Interlude or Semester's End instead. I like these two because, well, the Anthem feels perfectly fine to discover into, and it can protect us later if we need to, while Lazel's Acrobatics can potentially trigger Pantlaza multiple times. When blinked, Pantlaza counts as a different game object on the battlefield, so that gets through the once per turn clause if it ever enters multiple times on the same turn. Saving a big board and potentially adding to that board twice is 
is really cool for one spell to do. Even if this is the very first card that Puntlaza discovers into, there's still a potential to get more than just the one trigger, and that's really nifty. Plus, all of these spells are very budget friendly. And as it happens, some of these blink spells are really useful to save things off of that sneak attack too. Just some food for thought. It's high time I address the lands in this deck, though. For the most part, I actually quite like what I'm seeing here, but there are a few color fixtures that are, well, mid, and a few utility lands that are really lacking. I'm going to get rid of the reveal from hand lands, because I hate these, sorry, not sorry, and we're going to get some much better dual lands in here instead, which are currently still decently cheap from their Doctor Who printings. And then this other batch of utility lands are meh here. Myriad Landscape I like a lot in one and two color decks, but here I'd rather play Cross and Verge. Temple of the False God and Arch of Arazka, meanwhile, don't feel as good to me as some classic graveyard hate would feel. Scavenger Grounds and Pit of Offerings will royally mess up my day if I'm across the table from you, so I advise using them to disrupt necromancy players like myself. Adding in some expensive enchantments earlier, and having now added in that Scavenger Grounds, sort of makes my eyes linger on some of the other cards in this list, particularly from the Rubble. I want to like this card, but I think it just might be a little too slow for me. It can synergize with the Blink stuff that we added, I'll, I'll give you that, but it would non-bow with the Scavenger Grounds that we just added, and I don't know, at least in my games, there's often a lot of rogue graveyard exile effects just running around the format in general. So this card could get rendered completely moot if our graveyard happens to get swept up as collateral damage against someone exiling all the graveyards against a Muldrotha or a Marin player. Maybe I'm biased in my perception of how frequent graveyard exile effects are here, that's in fact quite likely, but I just think if we're already using those Blink effects to save us from the downsides of a board wipe, and if this card is kind of expensive to cast in the first place, and if it's the only thing in our deck that mentions the graveyard at all, I think all of those little factors add up to a card that we can afford to cut to make room for something else. I have another couple of cuts to make too, as it happens. Savage Stomp does not impress me, even if it can be cast for one mana. You know what would just feel better? This deck doesn't have a blasphemous act yet, and that itself is a blasphemous act. I get why board wipes are hard in a Puntlaza deck. Discovering into a board wipe feels pretty meh. I mean, you can put that card into your hand off of the Discover so you still draw the card, but really, you want to be flipping into cool free spells with Discover, right? So cheap board wipes feel yucky to discover into. But it's basically impossible to discover into a Blasphemous Act. And not only that, this card can even trigger Enrage if we need some extra effects as things are on the way out. I just want very, very much to cast this card with a Wrathful Raptors in play and just watch the fireworks. Finally, the dinos themselves. There's a reason I haven't tackled them too much so far. This is a really solid starting cast. The support cards were the much bigger thing to scrutinize, because the dinos are just doing their thing, and they're doing it well. I only have one dino that I think we ought to add in, and I have two to cut, and let's be honest, I bet you can guess one of them already. The two I'm critical of are the Dino Egg and the most reprinted card in all of Commander Precon history, Zatalpa. Seriously, Wizards loves putting this card into so many precons, but you know what, at least it made sense in this particular preconstructed deck. I'm still not wild about Zatalpa, though. I kinda almost like the Egg, but I just want to go rawr a bit more often than it lets us. So since I'm not in love with either of those, I'm going to cut them, and that leaves us with room for one more card in the deck, and I just think that Hulking Raptor needs a home here. A dino that can also help us cast more dinos just feels really good, and it kind of brings things full circle. We don't need expensive artifacts and pesky humans to give us mana. Our dinos are pretty solid at ramping us too. Whew, that was a lot. But before we finalize, let's address some honorable mentions for the more lavish and luxurious dino players out there. First, the draw effects. Green has terrific draw spells that you could play here if you're craving just a little bit more card advantage. Library in particular can help you set up a top deck to discover into, which is very neat. The land base, of course, is another huge area for optimization, as is always the case. You, you don't need me to tell you that fetches and besage who's are good cards. As I understand it, there are also more competitive builds of Puntlaza, especially using food chain combos, and of course, if folks wanted to tutor specific dinos to the top of their decks to discover into, that could also be very powerful. But of course, the real stars of the show would be the dinos themselves. Don't let all those support cards distract you from the thing the deck is actually all about. If you really want to spare no expense, dinos on a spaceship and some of those Jurassic Park cards just feel really hard to beat in terms of best creature upgrades. With any luck, those cards won't stay super expensive forever. Fingers crossed that their price comes down one day. And that ought to do it. Here we've got our Puntlaza sun-favored list, void of humans and with a free companion, because why the heck not? You can find this list in the description below, but we're not quite done. Let's also see if we can make this deck a bit more budget-friendly.
Okay, look, I know technically the cheapest way to acquire this deck is by getting the precon, but I mean, still, why not practice a little budget brewing while we have the opportunity? First, what are we losing? Expensive lands like the Triome, Cavern of Souls, and all three of the Shock lands? Sure, that totally tracks. Some significant dinos are lost too. I think those are probably the biggest pain to lose, to be honest, but I mean, hey, we'll live. After that, Great Henge and Skullspore Nexus, plus the Welcome to Jurassic Park spell. Those are big hitters, but I'm not too broken up about them. And finally, Heroic Intervention and Acroma's Will, too. I know Acroma's Will came in the precon, so plenty of folks with this commander will probably own it, but still, this is the budget version, let's honor that as best we can. So, that's them gone, and how do things look now without all of those cards? Well, nearly $200 cheaper, that's how. 13 cards cut, only 8 of which were actual spells, and we save ourselves more than half the price of the list. And as exciting as a whole bunch of those cards were, it's not like they were the heart and soul of the deck. We're still packing so, so many amazing dinosaurs with bonkers cool abilities that will totally wreck our opponent's day. Dinosaurs jeer at the concept of money. They will stomp on you regardless of whether the deck is expensive or whether it's budget. To fill in the lands gap, I'm going to opt for pain lands, which are nicely cheap right now, as well as adding two basic lands back in. That gets us back up to 36 lands, still helps us fix our colors, still leaves us with other dual type lands in the deck to fetch, and most importantly, it doesn't hurt our tempo at all. We lost some protective spells too, but you probably already know what I'm going to replace those with. More blink spells can replace the heroic intervention style effects and not only save our key pieces, but potentially net us some extra discoveries in the process. After that, I think if we're on a bit of a stricter budget, we can also use a little more ramp too, so I'm getting these two cards in here. I know Liquid Metal Twerk doesn't fix colors, yes I said that one wrong too, but at least this time it was on purpose, but it does turn things into artifacts, and some of our dinos are really proficient at destroying artifacts. Cursed Mirror meanwhile I just adore in general, but it's an especially good late game card to draw because it can also trigger our commander's discover ability. The faster we ramp, the faster we can get to discovering a bunch of stuff, and these mana rocks have really cool utility. Gotta love them. And of course, how will we replace the expensive dinos? Well, the dinos that I just barely couldn't find room for in the first list were Flaming Tyrannosaurus and Realmwalker. And you know what? I'll add in a Tranquil Frillback too, which I believe is from the Aftermath set, which means it's been nearly forgotten. Realmwalker is just a changeling that can give us some card advantage, as well as helping us predict our discoveries, and the Tyrannosaur triggers every time we discover. That's very fun to me. Frillback, meanwhile, is great for dealing with various types of problems around the board, and it's especially annoying to our opponents when we blink it. And okay, this last one is me just being kind of cheeky, but since we don't have Galta the Stampeder anymore, I'm filling our final card slot with a regular, overwhelming Stampede. Okay, actually this one is more of a replacement for the Acroma's Will that we lost, because I just want us to have a good finisher spell, but still, Stampedes. This is a card that makes the deck go boom. And that's all there is to it. A new Pontlaza Sun favored deck with a new looking budget, too. You can find both this deck list and the first list, along with a link to all of our deck lists, in the video description box below. I hope you've enjoyed discovering things with Pontlaza, and if you have any secret tech that you want to share with your fellow. Okay, I was going to say dino enthusiasts, but I think now I have to say sun flavored <laughs> enthusiasts. Leave them down in the comments below. Like and subscribe, do that whole rigmarole, and thanks so much for watching. Bye.